What's good, y'all? It's your boy Ross back out again with another video. So we're gonna check out 10 WWE signings that were 100% pointless. Sometimes WWE gets a big name or or a name that you know uh, a lot of people may know in the independent scene or on the indies, and they come to WWE and they don't even utilize them correctly. And at some point, you you kind of start to question what was the point of actually bringing them in. They didn't even utilize them correctly. They didn't build a, a proper feud with them. No one, like the casual fan, didn't care because they didn't really buy into the character because they weren't properly promoted. It's a, it's a multitude of things, but a lot of times it, it, it comes down to creative and how they're presented and if people actually give a damn. You know, so we're, we're going to check out some of these moments where people were just brought in you was just like what was the fucking point appreciate all love and support you guys have shown on the channel let's get right into this one man when wwe signs a wrestler the aim is always to maximize their potential and hopefully yeah. reap the financial rewards of their investment while some wwe signings pay off in a huge way with uh -huh. names such as brock lesnar aj styles and even logan paul all exceeding expectations uh -huh. sometimes signings just don't live up to their potential Whilst on occasion this can be the wrestler's fault, as the wrestler in question just isn't as good as the WWE thinks they are, it can often yeah. be down to WWE being unable to book and present the wrestler correctly. Like I Join just us said. now as WrestleMania looks at 10 of the most pointless WWE signings ever. Be sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell for daily wrestling videos and follow us on Facebook for exclusive lists. Also check out our new channel, WrestleMania Shorts. Number 10, The Public Enemy. In 1999, WWE decided to sign the well, popular way tag team known as The Public Enemy. The duo consist of Johnny Grunge and Rocco Rock were well established in the wrestling world, so this was a great opportunity for WWE to elevate their tag division. Unfortunately, their run in the company would be a total flop, as they weren't accepted backstage and this stemmed from the oh. fact that the two chose to sign for WCW over WWE in the mid-90s. Oh, their brief run fell apart when damn. during a match with the APA, the two decided they wanted to change the match finish just before they went through the curtain. This bold move didn't sit well with anyone, especially the APA, who virtually turned the match into a shoot. Oh, Vince McMahon's reaction wow. to the public enemy's act of defiance wasn't great either, as McMahon reportedly was done with the duo following the incident, and they would be released shortly after. Oh, damn. Number nine, Karma. Yeah, they were beating the crap out of them, like, damn near legit. When WWE decided remember to sign Karma, aka Awesome Kong, fans were elated. Yeah. Karma was a massive star in TNA, and everyone hoped that WWE would finally take the women's division seriously. Yeah. To WWE's credit, they managed to legitimately create a buzz not just around Karma, but also the entire women's division. However, it quickly fell apart. Yeah. She would announce her pregnancy on Raw, and this meant that she was forced to take a step back from the squared circle. It and was sometimes stuff like that happens, and that's unfortunate, and that kills a momentum. You know what I'm saying? Like, sometimes someone gets injured. As soon as they come in, they have WWE has big plans for them. And then sometimes situations like this where she ends up getting pregnant and she can't wrestle. So, and then that just killed all the momentum for her. But I do remember they were making her a very big deal. Vignettes and everything. When she came out there, I was like, oh, I'm here for it. Because she doesn't look like all the other dainty girls out there. The dainty women out there. You know what I'm saying? The bikini clad women. No, she looked like she was going to kill you. And I was there for it. I was all for this. It was just unfortunate she ended up getting pregnant. Such a shame as Karma's exciting run had to come to an end. And whilst fans were happy for her, yeah. there was also hope that she would eventually return for another full time run. But this never materialized. Hold on. It's, uh, what was asked? I was always hoping she would come for back for another full time run. But this never. Uh, if you don't mind me asking, is, is it actually true that you were granted release from WWE? I miss uh, you so much. Yes, it was. It doesn't mean I'll never be back. Never materialized. Damn, man. Number eight, Giant Silver. On paper, it looked like Giant Silver was going to be a great signing for WWE. He had the size, presence, and Vince McMahon was no doubt going to try uh -huh. making him a main event attraction. Yeah. He would become a member of the Oddities faction, but whenever he wrestled, he was quickly exposed as he was appalling in the ring. Oh. He had no notable matches and he lacked confidence when he was forced to do anything physical. He'd be released in 1999, making Silver's run a complete waste of time. Number 7, Eva Marie. 
Eva Marie's yeah, first run in WWE too. didn't exactly light the world on fire. No. She was poor in the ring, and while she was somewhat over with the audience, it would certainly be argued that she had go-away heat. Years after her initial run, WWE made the bold and controversial decision to rehire Marie. It wasn't clear why this was happening, as the women's division was filled with outstanding workers and Marie wasn't going to elevate the division in any way, shape or form. Nope. Fans hoped that she had improved in the ring, but they were all wrong, and if anything, due to the improvements in the women's division, her weaknesses came up even more noticeable. Yeah. She had some atrocious matches, and she even managed to have a SummerSlam match with Alexa Bliss, which was found at the top of several worst matches of 2021 Jeez, lists. Bro. She would eventually be released by the company, leaving everyone to collectively wonder why this second run needed to happen. Facts. Number six, Lord Tensai. A due to Matt Bloom got got caught up on the, the looks. She has the look. She just didn't have the in-ring ability. And we knew that. And Vince knew that. But you know. Making a name for himself in Japan, WWE decided to bring Bloom back into the company in 2012. This was Bloom pointless would become too. Lord Tensai, so and for pointless. the most part, his prior work as Albert and A Train would get retconned, and instead, WWE acted like Tensai was a completely new entity. This character flopped almost immediately, and Facts. even though WWE allowed him to propel up the card, defeating legends such as John Cena, the crowd wanted no part of Tensai's main yeah. event push. Facts. He'd be heckled with chance of Albert, and this led to WWE having no choice but to derail his push. Just a few months into Tensai's return, he would be relegated to the lower mid card, and before fans knew it, he was in a comedic tag team with Brodus Clay. Yeah. I mean, that just says everything, yeah. doesn't it? Number five, Sin Cara. Remember in February this 2011, too. a WWE held a press conference in Mexico City to announce the signing of Sin Cara. Sin Cara, who used the name of Mystico in other promotions, was a big deal within the wrestling world, and WWE hoped that he could potentially be the next Rey Mysterio. No. Sin Cara had problems almost immediately in WWE, oh, as he man. couldn't grasp the WWE style. Yeah. This led to a lot of his matches having severe botches, botches and the yeah. casual WWE audience was struggling to see what all the fuss was about. Yeah. They would pair Sin Cara in matches with talented wrestlers such as Chavo Guerrero and even Daniel Bryan, but the connection with this audience simply wasn't there. They persisted with Sin Cara's push, but over time, he seemed to stop caring, and his in-ring work seemed to regress even further. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie to you, the lighting stuff was, I, yeah, it was, it was overdone. I was like, okay, all right, you can chill out with the, the dimmed out, the dimming of the lights. That, come on, stop it. Same thing with the hell in the cell when they had the, like the red lights. Like you can't see shit. The cell is red. The lights is red. Let's stop adding all the funny lightings to certain matches. Just let the matches be what they are or certain gimmicks. Eventually, he was moved down the card, and by 2014, he had parted ways with the company. Yeah. He likes to claim that WWE wouldn't let him keep his original style, and this was a major factor in why the character flopped. But WWE were yet to give up on the Sin Cara persona that they created, as they decided to give the character to Hunico, who yeah. would go on to portray the character for several years. Uh -huh. Number 4, Buff Bagwell. Buff Bagwell had all the tools to be a major player in WWE. Following WWE acquiring WCW in 2001, Bagwell was a hot commodity for WWE as the WWE fanbase wanted to see Bagwell on Raw and SmackDown. Unfortunately, his run was unbelievably bad as he rubbed virtually everyone up the wrong oh, way. Man. He would have a main event match on Raw with Booker T and the match was so poorly received, heavily influenced WWE's decision to cut ties with Bagwell. He would also have a confrontation with Shane Helms which Bagwell was said to have instigated. Helms had fit into the WWE family perfectly and was mm -hmm. said to be insanely popular backstage, so naturally, Bagwell was going to take most of the heat. Yeah. According to Jim Ross on his podcast, Bagwell just wasn't the right fit for WWE. Well, Buff just he thought he, he had a higher uh, opinion of his work than Vince did. And, you know, I, I've become the bad guy because I'm the middleman. I'm the guy that delivers the bad news or the uh -huh. good news at times. But I don't, I don't hold any animosity to this very, to this day on Mark Bagwell whatsoever. I saw where he, he had a car wreck and it was involving, I think drinking maybe, uh, he just wasn't a good fit Conrad. And he, you know, uh, that partying lifestyle, mm. you know, we're trying to distance ourselves a little bit from that if we could. And, and I, and again, you know, Vince just didn't see the money in Mark that Mark saw it himself. And that's one of those things. It, it really comes down to Vince seeing the money. In you you can see it and you should see the money in yourself but vince you have to convince him of why he should invest in you more why should you get more tv time why should you be at the top of the card he has to see it once he sees it in the fans 
and in the in the in in the sense of people wanting to see you more, people requesting it, then he'll all right. What you want? What 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 we need to do? That's just Vince is all about business, bro. It's nothing personal. He wants to make the most money possible. If he wants the stars that's going to make the most money possible, that's what he cares about more than anything else. Are you entertaining? Can you make me a lot of money? All right, cool. Let's get you in. Number three, Nathan Jones. Nathan Jones was given every tool imaginable to succeed. Upon debuting, it was immediately thrown into a storyline with The Undertaker, and this was a clear sign that WWE expected big things from Jones. Big sweaty man. The problem was that Jones just wasn't great in the ring. And whilst he had the size, he lacked the charisma, and fans just cheered him due to him being associated with Taker. Yeah. Jones was initially going to be set for a major WrestleMania match, as he was going to team with the Dead Man to take on Big Show and A-Train at WrestleMania 19. However, due to Jones not being ready for such a high-profile matchup, WWE ruled it would be better off if Undertaker wrestled in a handicap match instead. Wow. Eventually, Jones had enough of the WWE lifestyle, and during a tour of Australia, Jones decided to stay home and never return to the company. Damn. They had wasted so much of their resources on him, and it's crazy to think how much the Undertaker rub would have benefited someone else who had genuine love and passion for pro wrestling. Number two. Yeah, that's kind of crazy. He said, all right, well, I ain't coming back. Damn. Scott Steiner. In 2002, WWE decided to re-sign Scott Steiner. Oh, Steiner had made man. a name for himself as a single star in WCW, and he was arguably one of the biggest names in pro wrestling. Steiner would instantly be positioned in the main event scene, uh -huh. and WWE saw dollar signs with a feud with Triple H over on Raw. Yep. Unfortunately, the feud flopped in the worst way imaginable. Yep. Steiner's in-ring work had regressed to such a level that he could barely have passable matches, and the crowd began to vocally turn on him. Steiner mm -hmm. would go from having a back-to-back -back world title matches on pay-per-view to being absent from WrestleMania 19. Following WrestleMania, Steiner would be cemented in the mid-card, where he would remain until he departed WWE the following year. And number one, Cain Velasquez. Oh, he definitely Cain Velasquez's deserves to be at the WWE top of this run list. was doomed from the start, as they made a complete blunder during his debut. He would debut just after Brock Lesnar had squashed Kofi Kingston to win the WWE title, oh. and this was a move which made fans insanely angry, and WWE believed that debuting Velasquez would make everything okay. No. The fans had no interest in seeing the former UFC star, and they were collectively bewildered why Velasquez was even signed to the company. Yeah. He would face Lesnar at the Crown Jewel pay-per-view, and it lasted just over a minute before he tapped out. Yep. He was immediately released, meaning he only had one official match on pay-per-view. At one stage, WWE were planning to bring in Velasquez as a surprise in the Royal Rumble, but in a bizarre move, Velasquez decided to tell everyone what WWE were planning, so they had no choice but to scrap the plans. He was a complete waste of time and money, and it highlighted how out of touch WWE management were by thinking that fans wanted to see Velasquez as a top star in the company. But there you have it, folks. 10 of the most point. Definitely deserves to be at the top of the list. I mean, they completely destroyed Kofi and everything that he had earned and worked for only to bring in Cain Velasquez and they thought people were gonna be like oh this is awesome no this was not awesome and it was a waste of time the fact that he even told that he was going to be in the Royal Rumble was a waste of time it was a waste of time it was pointless once again I understand Kofi losing to Brock even though some people were like, some people I know would be like, no, that doesn't make sense. It shouldn't be happening. I get it at the time that was going to happen. I understood that when they made the match, most likely Kofi's not winning. But he deserved better. He deserved to have some type of offense. And they jobbed him out only to have him feud with Cain Velasquez. It, it was pointless. So it definitely deserves to be at the top of the list. Comment down below. Let me know some other pointless WWE signings that wasn't on this list. There's a few that you just have to kind of question yourself. Like, what was the point of even signing them? They didn't add nothing to the company at all. Let me know if they weren't on this list down below. But I appreciate all love and support. Road to 150K. And I'm still young. Speedy YouTube wrestling champion of the world. Appreciate y'all kicking it with me. See y'all next one. Peace.